uh, virtually. So this is uh, our first show of the 2020-21 school year, and uh, I'm thrilled to be with a whole new uh, crew of TV studio students from Dover Sherburn. Uh, today we have with us Alex Versa, Alexandra Mart Martinovich, and Laurie O'Sullivan. And uh, so uh, these guys are in today um, are, uh, and, um, and as we everyone knows, we're on a hybrid schedule. So the high school students are in two days a week and remote three days. So uh, actually, I'm sorry, you guys are remote today. I take it back. So um, anyway, they have some questions for me related to the opening of school and uh, and I'm happy to answer them. So, um, Alex, would you like to begin? I would love to. And uh, before I start, I'd, I'd like to thank you for coming on. Uh, it's always a blast. All right. So, uh, question one is: uh, What were some of the projects that needed to be accomplished this summer in preparation for this school year? Yeah. So, uh, our our uh, our opening conversations really started in. May and June, um, we had to figure out, um, first of all, what the circumstances would be uh, for us um, in school. And so superintendents across the state were in bond because we're not medical professionals. And so uh, we relied on the state for what we've referred to as guidance, right? So the state looked to the Department of Public Health and we then turned to the state and the state and Department of Health said, if you're going to return to school, these standards must be met, right? So one of the first things that we had to figure out was, can we uh, accommodate students in our schools with appropriate spacing, right? Because the state said there had to be three to six feet between students in the classrooms. And um, so one of the big first steps was to go into the classrooms, lay out the, ta the chairs and see if we could in fact fit kids. Because if we couldn't, that was one of those deal breakers. If we couldn't fit kids with appropriate space, then we couldn't have any in-person instruction. So that, that was kind of a tedious big thing. And then, of course, you know, we had to ask ourselves, okay, well, um, are our schools safe uh, for large numbers of people uh, in enclosed places, right? Because at the high school, uh, you know, there's probably six or seven rooms. Um, Mr. Kaplan's is one that comes to mind. Uh, but those rooms across from the courtyard, upstairs and downstairs, are enclosed completely with no windows, right? And so um, we needed to, ch at that time, we didn't know if we could use those. We kind of believed we couldn't because we couldn't get enough airflow in there. So we took those out of the mix. And that meant without those classrooms and Dover Sherman being typically full, that meant we can't have all the kids in at one time. So then we had to start thinking about, okay, well then what model would, it, would we go with? And that's eventually after tons and tons of conversations, we started this reopening task force that was 80 people strong. Your principals were there, um, teachers were on it, central office people. I mean, it was loaded with people. And um, we, we had that uh, reopening, um, um, task force that broke into subcommittees and those subcommittees then looked at these these key areas so when you talk about what was the biggest thing probably just just synthesizing tons of information to figure out how we could keep the place safe bring kids back and whether or not we could do it period and then um, of course in all of that we had to make sure that the teachers association the teachers union was going to be comfortable with it because no teachers, no school. Uh, we had to be sure that our boards of health were going to be comfort comfortable with it because they could shut us down in a heartbeat. They have that kind of authority. And then we had to make sure our school committees, three school committees were on board with it. So 
I mean, I don't even know where to begin when you ask what was the, what was the biggest thing, Alex. But that's in a nutshell some of the big stuff. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, and one last question before I hand it off to Lori. Um, what were some of the harder decisions you had to make in getting the 2020 to 2021 school year ready? Um, <clears throat> the hardest decisions, th there were just so many as my last answer kind of suggested. And probably the toughest decision ultimately was realizing I can't do this myself. There's just no way. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to spread this out. There's just no way. So I had to let go of kind of the controls and trust different people. So that was really hard to to do. And um, but ultimately, some of the, the the one of the ones that kind of kept me up at night. That was the conversation that we used to have. That was the 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 question I would ask people as we were going through this. So what's keeping you up at night? Like the one thing that was really keeping me up at night, honestly, was what about the little kids? Like what about the kindergartners, the first graders, the second graders, the kids who can't read yet, who need to learn how to read and who need that social, um, uh, social experience in order to develop properly into adults? Um, an adult who missed out on critical steps in their development as a child uh, they, they could really pay a price in life. And I, that was what was keeping me up at night. So the big decision was, can we start school with the little kids in exclusively uh, full time and the other kids not? That was probably the one that kept me up the most. And ultimately, as you probably know, we did not um, have the little kids come in full time, but we are striving to do that and we're hoping to do that actually starting on the 26th. So uh, we believe, I believe in my heart of hearts that you guys are able to work more independently than those little guys. And so I'm, uh, and I've also gotten feedback from kids that the remote isn't, it's not ideal, but it's, you, you can still make it work. So um, yeah, I'd say thinking about the, Thinking about the model for the youngest kids was the toughest decision. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to take over and ask a couple questions now. Um, the first one being, what new changes did you have to make to the building to make it more safe for COVID? So um, as you guys know by now, I hope, um, what we know about the virus is that it spreads through droplets primarily. So when you speak, you know, you, it's like spittle, you know, it comes out of your mouth and you don't necessarily even see it. So when you cough, it's even worse. When you sing, it's even worse. When you yell, it's worse. Uh, when you talk softly, it's not as bad. But the CDC and uh, Department of Public Health at that time, when we were starting, were saying, six foot is the distance that it takes before those droplets that come out of people's mouths hit the ground. I know it's kind of gross, but this is our reality. It's about six feet before they hit the ground. So we, we had to factor in how do we keep people safe if that's the case. Meanwhile, in a very uncertain period, and then only, honestly, only in like the last week have I heard anything definitive, maybe two weeks, we were hearing, I was seeing in the research that aerosols um, are also a concern. So it's kind of hard to backfill all this information and you guys may know this, but the fact of the matter is there's been a debate in, in the medical profession, like uh, the World Health Organization especially, about whether or not viruses can be passed just through the air. In other words, they're floating around more than six feet. They're floating around, lingering in the air, almost like an invisible cloud. That's referred to as the aerosols. And if you think of it as the mister, like a, a humidifier in your house, like you know, in, in the winter when you use that mister, that mist that you can almost not even see, but you know it's there because it's keeping your room um, more humid. And um, so they were battling over whether or not aerosols 
were a threat. And if aerosols were a threat, um, that's a whole nother layer of concerns. So initially when we started this, the real concern was the droplets. And that meant six feet distancing, and that meant putting up barriers that would stop the, the droplets, right? So that's why you see the um, plexiglass all over the buildings. Uh, that's why you see this crazy configuration in the cafeteria where kids sit in these distances and everyone has to sit the same direction. We had to lay all that stuff out. We, in the front of your classrooms, there's a space for the teacher to be separated that hopefully, it's supposed to anyhow, have six feet distance. So that was all in, in response to the droplets. But then when we started talking about the aerosols, which nobody would say definitively that this was an issue because scientists have gone back and forth. Oh, I don't believe it. I don't think it, we can't prove it. We can't prove it. Finally, the CDC just maybe a week or two ago said, yeah, we do think aerosols is a real issue. So that means if you're in a room with someone who's sick and they're coughing or breathing or singing, the things are out there floating around. That means everyone in that space is at risk, not just the people six feet away. That's a whole different worry. So that caused us to then look at our ventilation systems, right? And you know, you see those ducts up on your ceiling, those, um, those grills on the ceiling where air comes in. And one is bringing air in, one is bringing air out typically. We had to make sure that the air coming in was obviously the right amount of fresh air and that the air going out or being sent back in, sometimes it's on a recycle, was being filtered. So we have special filters, they call MERV 13s. Those are thicker filters, basically. They, the air goes through them and it screens out all the, the bad stuff, right? If you put a MERV 13 on top in, in your air machines up on top of the building, it could actually strain the machine to the point that it breaks down. So there were tons of complications around that and making sure that um, we had the right filters in. And, um, and actually this week, uh, we, we, we finally went out and got an independent report because some people said, well, if you just ask the people who typically work on your air conditioning, they're gonna tell you what you wanna hear. They're gonna say, ah, you're fine, everything's okay because they've been working on it for the past 20 years. So if it's not okay, then that's a black mark on them. So they tell us everything's okay. People were worried about that. So we hired a company to do an independent evaluation of our ventilation across all the, the district, all five buildings, high school, Linquist, middle school, Chickering and Pine Hill. And um, we just got that report. And so that means some changes to our facility. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff, guys. Obviously the tents, um, but, but the tents that haven't really been used. So, I mean, so we were flying blind on this and every day was a new beginning, but really the biggies were the plexiglass, the spacing and the um, ventilation. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that we've touched on this next question a lot. So I think I'm gonna skip down okay. one to this next question, which is, has DS thought of getting tests for the students? Yeah, great question. Really, really good question. So um, there's two different kinds of testing that we could have done. And the answer is yes, we talked about it quite a bit. Um, so there's two different kinds of testing. And one is um, um, surveillance testing. There's really many possibilities, but this uh, surveillance testing would be, we're just gonna test people as they come in, for example, and, um, and we'll find out if anyone is sick. Seems pretty logical, right? But there's a, one little hitch, or there are several hitches, but one is that if I tested kids, say, so my daughter goes to school, she goes to college, and they test her on Wednesday, every Wednesday, and that makes people feel safer, right? Because they're testing the kids. Well, there's one little problem. What if the kids are out partying and going wild starting on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday? And they're in big groups or they're playing sports or they're not wearing masks and they're not socially distancing. 
then that test really only was helpful for that day. It told you if anyone in your crowd had it that day. But after that, if they go out and get infected and they're still spreading around, that's not really that helpful. So that was one problem with it. And we definitely looked at it. Another problem with it was that it's hugely expensive. Like roughly, uh, if probably 10 to 15,000 a, a day. And um, so if you start adding, and that would be, you know, once a week. No, sorry, 10 to 15,000 a week if you did it once a week. So if you doubled it or tripled it or did it every day, you do the math. It's well into the millions, well into the millions. And we build a budget every year. We build the budget, like we'll start building the budget this year for next year in about a month, even now. So we are already built a budget. We, we can't just say, oh, we'll just spend two million dollars it's two million dollars that we didn't account for so then we'd be in the whole two million and we'd say to the towns we don't have enough money to function so the cost was a huge factor so what we ended up doing is we secured five uh seats over at a place that does rapid testing it's called afc and it's in waltham so that if one of you guys were symptomatic you're home you're sick or one of our teachers your parents are worried, you've got a fever, it's 102 or 101.7, enough to be concerned about, you've got some of the symptoms, then if they can't get to their doctor, their doctor for whatever reason doesn't do rapid testing, which is possible, then they can go to this place and they can get a guaranteed uh, test and a quick turnaround. That allows us to find out pretty quickly if somebody has it, and then we can do the contact tracing to see who they've been with. So yeah, we've talked about the testing. By the way, that's controversial. People don't necessarily agree on this. Some people say, guess what? Find the millions and do it anyhow. Uh, you know, we're a pretty wealthy system. And if it's not budgeted, see if we can find the money somewhere else, like through donations or whatever. Uh, we're not there yet, but we'll see. That could change. Frankly, from a superintendent standpoint, uh, when I talk to superintendents, we're really frustrated because we feel like the state should have worked that stuff out before they even asked us to open schools. Have it all squared away. Don't, don't ask us to open schools if you don't have a plan. So uh, that's been ugly. That probably answers that question. Yes, thank you. I think I'm gonna pass it over to Alexandra now to ask the last couple questions. Perfect. Okay, so the first question is, looking back on the past three to four weeks of school, what has been going well and not so well? Um, good questions, guys. Uh, so what's going well is I think that kids are happy to be back in school. I think that kids are happy to have athletics back. And I think they're happy to see each other and their teachers. And so to me, that's that's a huge victory. Not everyone, but most kids are just they're happy to be out of their houses and just see people. We've been so locked down. And so, and to have like some stimulation, you can only watch Netflix so many times or watch, you know, Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook so many times before you just get bored out of your mind. So I think people have been happy to be back and I think that's gone really, really well. And we're finding that, you know, we're not seeing mass quantities of infections thus far, right? Still early and it's not flu season, so, but so far that's gone really well. So um, what, what hasn't gone well? Well, you know, we've had one ra rainy day, really one rainy day this school year. And um, that was a challenge, right? Because during lunch at your school, especially at the high school, kids need a place to eat. The high school kids are like no other. Right, they don't dig that setup in the cafeteria where everyone's sitting there by themselves facing in one direction. It's just very un high school like. And I say that as someone who was a high school person. It's just, it's a hard sell. And that's why on nice days, where do the kids go? Outside, right? And it's hard for us to keep them away from each other. So that's been a challenge uh, because. Kids are, we're human beings, right? We, and if, if ever it's become more noticeable to me, we're 
we are social beings. We like to be together. And so um, and we like to be close together. So I look out my window and I see the middle school kids out on a mask break and they're all running around and they, they jump into each other's arms and like, that's been a challenge for us. Another big challenge for us has been uh, performing arts because until actually yesterday, the state had been pretty much saying, you can't have any instruments, no singing, because those are big spread things. Uh, so because of the aerosols, quite honestly. Uh, so they've changed that position. And now just yesterday said that with 10 foot distancing and masks, which is pretty challenging, right? Um, you can now have those things. So that hasn't gone that well because we know kids who are into performing arts are really missing it. Are any of you guys into band or music or singing? So there you go. So it's a big loss for the kids who, who've, you know, that's their lives. They love it. They practice, they've worked very hard at it. Um, another thing that's that's not ideal in this whole thing is, you know, the kids who want to do sports, kids who are really competitive athletes or competitive in their performing arts and music or whatever and plan to pursue it further, this is really, this has really hurt their, their, in their minds, their chances of getting into school X or Y because they can't demonstrate in their junior or senior year how good they are or how much they've improved. So that hasn't gone so well, but we're getting there. Day at a time, we uh, we had planned to bring the, the kindergarten through three back on um, Monday the 19th, but one of our deals was that our rates in Dover and Sherburn combined needed to be below um, or under five per 100,000, there's a whole formula, and we ticked up over it. And so that set us back a week, so that didn't go well. But, um, you know, it's been, this has been like no other year in my experience, and I'm retiring, as you guys probably know by now. I have one year left, so in my entire experience, there's never been anything even close to this hard or this complicated, not even close. A lot of superintendents are, are, are wavering. Uh, a lot of school leaders are saying, I can't do this anymore. A lot of teachers, it's been really tough. So the whole thing's been hard, but the last few weeks, that's kind of it. So what else do you got for me, Alexandra? Um, we have one more question and you kind of like touched on it, but okay. how is the campus planning for winter when students will start eating lunch and spending break inside? Yeah, so uh, those those are big, big questions. Uh, I, you know, on the rainy day uh, last week, high school kids were using the middle school gym. So those kind of out of the box things are things that we have to do. The other thing that we are gonna have to do is really, strive to keep our windows open, which means kids are going to complain, right? They're going to go home, they're going to tell their parents they're freezing. So we're trying to mentally prepare people for that, telling people, bundle up, wear sweaters, you can always, or sweatshirts, you can always take it off if you get hot, you know, but dress in layers. You know, when, when I was a kid, we used to spend a ton of time outside. So we wore long johns, you know, and, uh, and it just, I liked, I liked that. It kept me warm, you know, under my jeans or whatever. So those kinds of things are things that people are going to have to do. So that if you, if you, if you, if your teacher says we're going outside for a mass break, you're not standing around in a pair of shorts. Like you need to dress for it. And uh, because we're going to still encourage people more than ever to go outside, even eat outside potentially. But you can't eat outside, for example, in a skirt or in shorts. Like that's not going to work in the winter. But if you had, like, if you guys are skiers, you know, people eat outside in the winter when they're skiing. I have many times, I've, but I've got my ski pants on or long johns on. So people are going to have to dress accordingly. And I think at, over time, we're, we'll figure out how to space ourselves better. The space is there. We're just, we're not accustomed to looking for it. Things like the courtyard. And, uh, but the courtyard is not enclosed, right? So you'd need you need to dress warmly. So um, it'll be a challenge. And the other thing that's gonna be a challenge is if we have infection rates go up in the winter. So I anticipate, you heard it here first, I anticipate that there are gonna be times that we have to close the schools 
for sure this winter. And for how long, I don't know. But I anticipate that we are not immune. We're gonna have sickness here too. It's gonna to spread around and we're gonna to have to close the schools. On the upside, statistically, kids, especially younger kids, are less likely to be seriously sickened by this. But with the older kids, it's a little more concerning. So that's why we're bringing the little kids back first. So, so there you have it. Can I ask you guys a question? I, I, I think we might have a couple more minutes. So can I ask you guys a few questions? Do you mind? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, sure. awesome. All right, so um, what, do you, what are you um, most frustrated with uh, in terms of the return? Because it's helpful for me to know like what's working and what isn't. What's the hardest part for you guys? And you don't have to worry about offending me or your teachers. If, if there are things that aren't working particularly well, whether it's technology or the schedule, what, what kinds of things are not, just, you know, you wish it could be a little different. I mean, just in terms of like, uh, Wi-Fi connection isn't always the best. Um, so, I mean, but that's unavoidable. That's the, that's a problem that necessarily the administration can really fix. Yeah. It is tricky, right? Because we have everyone on. I don't know if you guys were ever in the auditorium. Uh, there was, there was um, my first year, there was a bunch of kids in the auditorium. There was some kind of assembly. And somebody was trying to uh, stream something via the projector onto the screen, a teacher was, and they couldn't. And the reason was because everyone's phones were on and everyone was on the Wi-Fi and they were tapping the whole bandwidth. And so, yeah, that's that's one of a, one of our big challenges. I totally agree, and we are aware of it, and we're just doing our best. But it's, you know, we're we're not really built for this. This wasn't something we ever had in mind. And these Zoom meetings, for example, having all the other kids um, video off actually makes a difference, right? Because you haven't frozen on me once, but you guys were freezing on me when we when we started when everyone was on. So we're learning things that that are helpful. But what, that's a good, good, uh, good point, a good observation, Alex, and it's definitely something we're working on. Um, Laurie, can you think of anything that uh, that you'd like to see us maybe focus um, on? One thing is, I have one teacher who's fully remote, and the way that she's been zooming into class hasn't been working really well because everyone logs on to the Zoom individually, but then the teacher who's sort of proctoring our class is also zoomed in on a bigger screen and there's just a lot of like feedback and it's kind of hard to hear sometimes and we've tried with everyone wearing headphones or doing different things but I think I don't know trying to find out maybe if there was just one zoom like at the front of the class that everyone is on or something trying to figure out a different way to do that to make it easier to hear her yes um i actually know exactly what you're talking about uh when we first uh when we were planning this summer we had a retreat and so we had a few of the administrators were um remote so they were trying to remote in and we were all on the zoom so she could see us all and the feedback was it was a nightmare and we were trying to project something on the screen so those are things that we're, we're working on. And um, I know, I'm confident that your teachers are expressing those concerns. Another thing that I've heard teachers express concern about is that they worry about the remote kids, that they, they can't always hear or they miss things. That's, you know, it's just really, really tricky. We have families whose children wanted to be remote or students themselves, definitely wanted to be remote and the and the state said you have to let them then we have teachers who have for whatever reason need to be remote we had to let them uh, then we had the people who wanted to be in we had people who want to be in every day i mean we had people who want to be in without masks we it's complicated anything else alex um i don't really think i have anything to add to that good that's good news. <laughs> um, well, hey, 
you guys are troopers. That's the truth. You'll, you will never forget this. Your generation will be considered survivors of a pandemic and uh, people will want to ask you all about it, you know, through the generations. They'll want to know what it was like. So uh, keep on reading, keep on pushing yourselves. You know, school's not going to be perfect. So it's kind of on you to fill those voids, right? And pursue the things that you're interested in. If you're into performing arts or music, find ways to do it. Find ways to do it. Uh, and uh, we'll get through this, right? Yes, thank you, you. You guys rock, I'm proud of you. You're all sophomores, thank so you. you're gonna hopefully be back in school in person before you know it and we'll put this behind us. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you guys. I'll talk to you soon.